guys, welcome back to the show. It's great to be with you. This is your host, Hunter McWaters. I'm super stoked about this week's episode. Um, you know, as you guys have maybe noticed, I've been talking to a lot of um, different kind of TV personalities in the outdoor industry and um, having some really great podcasts. And I got more coming down the line as well. Um, today, I'm speaking with um, a lady, actually, who's who's been in the hunting industry for a long time, um, put out a lot of really good content, and she still is. Um, her stuff now is on Carbon, but she was on the Sportsman Channel for a long time. Um, her show is called Skullbound, and uh, you probably know who I'm talking about, but if you don't, her name is Jana Waller. Um, very accomplished uh, outdoor person or outdoors woman, however you want to say that. Um, she's a, a great hunter, very knowledgeable, um, and we just have a, a great conversation. She's super easy to talk to, so it just flowed. It was a great podcast, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, releasing it to you guys and sharing the conversation with you. Um, you know, she's also a member of the Mule Deer Foundation, and she's also a wildlife commissioner for the state of Montana, which is which is really interesting. So we get into all that and and more in this episode. Hope you guys enjoy it. Um, and one thing I do want to kind of bring back, if you've been listening for a long time, you might remember this. I haven't done it in a long time, but you know, the reviews uh, and ratings on Apple Podcasts are huge as far as growing the show and getting the word out about the show. And so, um, you know, my goal right now, I think I have about almost 250 written reviews uh, or ratings on Apple Podcasts. My goal is to get that to 500. Um, so if you are a new listener or a longtime listener and you haven't yet, I'm asking you to please, please go on there, give me a five-star review, and write a written review of the podcast. Now, if you write a written review of the podcast, it will it will pop up. I will see it, and I'm going to bring back something I used to do. Um, I'm going to read off your name um, in the intro of future episodes, and I will send you some swag in the mail, some decals, and some stuff like that So as a thank you. So go in there, leave me a written review, and then um, you know I will... Um, give you a shout out on the show. If you hear your name being called, uh, you can DM me, message me, email me, and I will send you some The Hunter's Quest swag. And um, it's just, a, it's a huge way of supporting me. You know, um, this show takes a lot of time, takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort. So if you enjoy it, you know, and again, this is all just released out for free. You know, I don't ask anything of you guys. So please, 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 if you are a new listener or you haven't done so yet, you enjoy the content, you want to support the show in some way without having to spend a dime, go in there, leave me a rating and review, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and I will send you some swag. So let's get on that, guys. Help me get to 500. Let's continue growing this uh, together. And thank you guys who have been listening for a long time for all your support. Now enjoy this episode with Jana Wally. Um, okay, guys, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with my guest this week, Miss Jana Waller. Thanks for being here with me. Oh, it's an honor. Thanks for asking. Yeah, we. Uh, I warn you, though, I get a bit chatty with this. We go on for hours. <laughs> no, that's good because that makes my job easy. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> the worst ones are when like you're like, so did you like that hunt? What was it like? And they're like, yeah, it was good. <laughs> Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> That'll exactly. never happen here, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. I like your uh, your backdrop. You got a. If you guys aren't watching, she's got a mountain lion like roaring right over her head. So I got to ask, what's the story on that guy? Oh, that was my first mountain lion. Um, and I, it's. I'm actually just sitting on my couch uh, with my coffee at hand, super casual. I, uh, my office is an absolute disaster. It's a. I call it the skull room, and uh -huh. so not pretty enough to do a podcast back there. But uh, no, this. This mount is absolutely one of my favorites, and it's so fun. It's such a conversation starter, yeah. <laughs> especially. And I'm a huge predator hunter, and I think that's probably the most misunderstood of all the hunts. And so I really like to do all. And I lately I've been doing a lot of podcasts that aren't even really in the hunt space. Hmm. So it's a kind of a good, you know, icebreaker talk about predator hunting. And but no, that was a Montana cat that I shot with my bow. Uh, I think around ten years ago. So. Oh wow! Is it a, a hound? style yep. hunt or yeah hound style hunt yep yep right outside of the bitterroot valley here which is where i live right now in montana we have lots of mountain lion nice mm -hmm. um 
Yeah, I saw a video the other day. You probably saw it on social media. The guy like backing up with a cougar like coming. I'm like, dude, drop your phone and shoot it. <laughs> Why are you recording I know, I saw this? There's another really famous one that went viral out of Utah. Was it last year or the year before where the guy's like yelling at the cat? And there's actually a pre story that you didn't really hear about how he stumbled across this cat with kittens. And oh. so she was super protective. And I think, I mean, it seemed like there was a mile. He didn't have a gun or anything, but he was backing away and filming it. She was slapping the dirt. And Oof. it's really funny because they're typically not that aggressive. Um, yeah. I've seen at least a half a dozen mountain lion. I've come across them while hunting other things. And, you know, all you do is go rah, and they basically turn inside out like a house cat and run away. <laughs> um, but every once in a while, you know, you get a situation like that where it's a protective mom. And oh, yeah. It gets Don't mess with mama. Or the one you were just talking about that I've seen quite a bit. Yeah. Every once in a while you get, it's like bears. You know, I'm, I am the biggest bear. I probably, I hunt, definitely hunt bear more than any other big game species. Um, it's become a weird passion of mine that I really didn't even expect. And um, it's like bears, they have their own personality and, you mm -hmm. know, you got to come across the wrong one. Yeah. So I did my first spring bear hunt this year i'd hunted bears out here on the east coast but it's different and i didn't even see any they were like nocturnal but mm -hmm. um i did my first spring bear hunt this year and it was so cool like i can't wait to go again i almost killed a f epic bear and then there was a bunch of bears i could have shot but they were like way across canyon and there's a river between and yep. me and mark had already done it one day and like it was hellacious okay, looking yeah. back i wish i had just embraced the suck and shot one anyway but we were trying to find one on our side of the river but all i have to say is like i cannot wait to get back out there this spring and hopefully get my first one. Oh, it's so much fun i love it so much and i montana is all spot and stock so i do that every year of course um and it's an over-the-counter tag mm -hmm. i know i run my own baits with my buddy heath i've been doing that for years so that's a totally different style hunt and often misunderstood because it's a baited hunt they think they just you just come in and you pick your bear and right. there's a lot of pressure over there i've also baited and hunted alaska alberta saskatchewan and so i've just grown into this bear freak and it is so much fun whether it's spot and stock i did my first bear hunting with hounds last year in utah because mm. i drew that tag um you can actually hunt certain places in montana now with hounds where that's a new rule but um that was a great experience too it's there's so many different kinds of bear hunting and every experience is so different but yeah there's so much fun. that's that's how most of the bear hunting in my area is done is with dogs and they even a lot of people hunt deer with dogs out here too oh that, i've never done that i know every time i say that to people out west they're like what you do what <laughs> <laughs> but it's like a huge Virginia, North Carolina thing. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. it's not necessarily my thing. I've done it, but um, it's it's a different hunting culture, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's so funny with social media, the way it is, you know, people are, are happy to throw in their two cents worth about a penny when they have, they've never done the experience, you know? And I get that a lot on, on my posts where, Oh, baiting this and that for bears. And they don't understand the terrain. First of all, I, right. I baited on the lock saw where it is so massive and so thick and there's simply too many bears. If you want to have a really healthy deer population, elk moose population, mm -hmm. you have to manage the bears. And over there, it's a two bear area. You're allowed two bears and, um, you've just got to keep them in check. And it's always those who have never done the experience who are so quick to judge. Yeah. There's so much, uh, just like infighting and like in the hunting world, it's crazy. Like I've been, the more and more I kind of do this and, and put myself out there, the more you see, like people just get so emotional. And like, if you do something they don't like, just like you're evil and it's just a lot of negativity and stuff. Yeah, it, it really can be. Um, Especially people like you, too, like on TV. I mean, like really putting yourself out there. I mean, and as a woman in the space, I'm sure you get lots of trolls hating on you and stuff. Yep. Yep. You get it all from every angle. And it's funny, back in the day, 13 years ago when I started this, it was definitely more emotional. Like you didn't know, how, you don't know how to handle it. And, you know, and, and some. You want everyone to like you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's human nature. And then you get, I had a guy, I actually had to hire an attorney out of Missoula to cease and desist this guy who was just harassing me so bad. And yeah. they crawled through the back end of his computer. He was a head of a, a animal rights group and that kind of, uh, but you don't know how much energy to give it. Well, now 
a de- you know, over a decade later, it's super easy. I just simply, I erase their comment, block and ban them. Like it's not yeah. even worth <laughs> Now on the other hand, if someone wants a, a discussion, like, oh, I thought mountain lions were endangered or something like that. That's a discussion I'm happy to have. And, right. and oh, do you actually eat that bear? You know, I'll, you know, you can tell pretty easily if it's it's just someone attacking you or attacking our way of living, or if it's someone with genuine interest who maybe just doesn't know any better. Those I will dialogue with, but the other ones that are rude, crude, if there's a swear word, a name calling, all that, just block, ban, and delete. And that's the best. That's yeah. The best of action yeah i was talking to so brian calls like kind of one of my mentors and he was saying the same thing he's like i used to like engage those guys and and like you said occasionally it is a a genuine conversation Mm -hmm. but yeah usually people that are just trolls like that they're already just entrenched in what they want to say and you're not going to change their mind anyway so he said the same thing he's just like i don't even pay attention just block done like you're gone (laughs) And there's two different kinds. I think there's the hardcore anti hunters that I can, I can tell when they gather up and they send, okay, we're going to attack this hunter today. Cause all Mm. of a sudden, like, in fact, they were out in droves just last week. My uh, business partner, Heath shot a beautiful bull um, with his bow and I posted it and, and it's weird. I've rarely lately get comments on any field photo like that. And they were just out in the drove, like, Oh, you know, this majestic animal breeds no more, blah, 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 blah. And it was like <laughs> 20 of them. So you know that what they do is they purposefully go out yeah. and they'll target somebody. In, in, and it's just so funny because I don't, when would that have ever stopped anybody? All it does is give us more fuel mm-hmm. to promote what we love, you know? Mm-hmm. And then there's the other kind that are hunters who, whether it's, you know, a scarcity mentality is, is rampant in this industry as well as others where my dad taught me years ago. Um, and it wasn't even about hunting at the time we're talking 30 years ago. He used to always talk about scarcity mentality in business and how, uh, um, or that's how it came up. But in general, in life, there are people out there who think if you have happiness, money, success, whatever it is that there's only so much happiness or success or money in the world. It's like a pie. And if someone else has that, you, they have a piece of the pie that's no longer there. Yeah, less and for you. Happiness is scarce. And it's just so, it's just so not like that. And I, I feel like with in the hunting and fishing industry, like there's people out there that if you find success or happiness, they think you stole something from them or that's not longer there. And that's a different yeah. kind. Those to me are actually more upsetting when I see hunters attacking each other. It's yeah. more upsetting to me than some anti who's clearly calling me the C word and B word, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I was talking to a buddy about this other day because it's, it's funny because I'm kind of, you know, on this this path and um, and trying to do what I love and, you know, be really genuine about it and do it in the right way. And um, But one of my, like, you know, one of my good buddies is, like, so um, – you know, anti like hunting influencer, you know, and like, um, it's just funny. Like that, it does seem to hurt the worst when, um, it's like your friends or other hunters. Um, it's just like, I don't, I don't get kind of the negativity, you know? I mean, I understand some people have, have made big mistakes, but, and we should be, and we are held to a higher standard than your average hunter. But, um, I don't know. But it, yeah, it is. It, it, I think those people, though, tend to, if you just sit back and watch, the negative Nellies of the world tend to be outed. Like, they tend to, like, they're the kind of guys, and it's it's funny, I don't even see it hardly ever from girls um, inside the industry mm-hmm. um, or women hunters. I mean, when I say industry, I just mean all of us. We're one one big happy family. Well, maybe not happy all the time, but one big family. <laughs> and um, But, like, I don't really see women doing it to each other. I see women supporting each other and hurrahing each other and like yeah. super excited for one another. I see it definitely more with men, but um, they also seem to be the guys that are always doing that, who are always going on to other people's posts, being negative, being the a-holes of the world. And I think after a while people see like, Oh, that's, that's yeah. what they're all. It's about. just him yeah. again. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I had this one guy who like every time I would post and he's kind of in the industry a little bit or wants to be or something i don't know anyway he would always have something to say like always has something to say and for so long i just tried to like oh you know maybe he's balancing me out you know i'm just having back and forth and then finally i was just like no i'm i'm done with you i just blocked it yeah. <laughs> yep yeah i have no problem blocking or banning people if they're 
it, you know, constantly negative. Yeah. You know? It's like, come on, just stop. Um, and like with just, anything in life, that's so draining. Like, yeah. it, it, you know, I actually, a lot of people don't even know I come from the financial industry before I mm. got into the hunting industry and I was I worked for Edward Jones for 10 years. And even, even there, you know, you, it, and I'm sure with every industry and I was in outside sales before that. And it's like, I just, choose to surround myself with people who celebrate you, not tolerate you. And I Mm -hmm. think, and that's a quote from my, my friend, Julie McQueen. Um, and I, it's stuck with me for so long. And I just think it's a great way to live life. Like, and not everybody's going to support you or celebrate you in your inner circle, but it's funny, the older you get, how much that circle shrinks. For sure. And you know that there are people out there who really have your back and who really want you to succeed. And yeah, and uh, those are the people I tend to gravitate towards. Yeah, yeah, I like to I like to stick around. I, get, I mean, <laughs> positive people myself. Um, yeah. So, but you mentioned you know women, um, and uh, you know women in general kind of get a bad rap for like hating on each other a lot. I feel like, but I kind of feel like it, it, like you said, it's almost like flip flopped in the hunting industry. Um, but anyway, but what's it been, which is good. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, but what's it been like, um, you know, being a woman in the space? Um, I, th- I think it's been amazing. Like, I feel like it has opened so many doors for me. Now I got that question recently on a different podcast. Um, I, and I think it, it, it warrants some backstory and that <laughs> it's a beautiful thing being older in the industry right now. I would not want to be trying desperately to be a younger gal in breaking into the hunting and fishing Mm. industry because like you said your friend who hates the influencers type um i think when i started skullbound on sportsman's channel i had already been like a freelance writer and kind of dabbled in in outdoor writing and i mean pre-internet magazine kind of stuff (laughs) but when i started the show i want i wanted to start the show with my ex because i felt like most of the hunting shows I watched didn't talk about the fact that we're such animal lovers and conservation. Mm -hmm. And, and so when we started and I had already even way before Skullbound had been a skull artist donating a ton of my artwork to ducks unlimited pheasants forever, the groups that I belong to. So I wanted to incorporate all that into a show and show that. And when I started, there weren't any other, not that I knew of solo female hosted shows, you know, and now there's Melissa Bachman, who's a good friend of mine, who's just amazing. And Christy Titus and a lot of other solo female hosted shows. But when, when I branched out like 13 years ago to sportsman's channel and told them I had this idea and they said, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we went with that. It has, I feel like being a woman really opened the doors for me, but at the same time, I'd already been a big game hunter, like 17 years, I think when I started like over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me because I could walk the walk, talk the talk. I'd been on, you know, I have, I've been a bow hunter since I was 19. So this will be my 30 some year. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, Whoa, she's about to give it out. (laughs) I don't care. You can Google it. Okay. But you know, like three decades of bow hunting. And, um, and then when I moved out to Montana 13 years ago, 12 years ago, 13, um, started getting into long range rifle shooting and training with emo and a couple other groups. And, um, and then I got into pistol hunting like six years ago. So I kind of, and now muzzle loader hunting. So I kind of do it, do it all, but it's helped that I'm older. Yeah. And can, like I said, kind of walk the walk, talk the talk. So I feel like, um, back to your question, what's it like being a woman in the industry? I think it's been incredible. I, yeah. it's nothing new to me. Cause I've always kind of been, um, a woman in a male dominated industry, whatever that industry was. But at the same time, I feel like, yeah, you get the occasional negative guys who want your job or they feel like, how does she get her job? And you know, that kind of stuff. And that's, I feel that goes back to scarcity mentality. And I feel like that's in any category of life. Yeah. But I feel like as a woman, it's really been beneficial. Um, it's opened the doors for me. I think there are a lot of companies in the hunting and fishing space that really love to work with solid women who have, yeah. you know, um, who can, how do I say this? You know, who aren't maybe the typical influencer who maybe aren't shooting their bows and their bikinis in the backyard who aren't <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that girls, but whatever, you know what I mean? Like no, I you. women who can talk gear, who can talk backcountry style hunting women who can kind of, um, 
be able to hold those conversations and yeah. kind of like have you said, walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's been wonderful, and I've like I've surrounded myself with amazing companies that I so wholeheartedly believe in, mm-hmm. and I'm lucky to have a lot of friends who are super supportive. But it's been I nothing I planned out, but it's just the most incredible journey. And yeah. I, I, I just feel blessed literally every day that I get to do what I love. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe in the context of, well, I kind of more interested just in your perspective, not just as a female in the space, but just as a person in the space. Um, have you seen it change a lot since when you started till now and how I so? Seen, yeah, I have seen a lot of changes. First of all, the business model has changed. You know, when I uh, launched the show on Sportsman channel, social media wasn't even a part of the marketing package, right? right. I didn't even have Instagram. Did I? Yeah, I had Facebook. I didn't have Instagram then. And it, you know, um, <laughs> it, I don't even think it was around. Maybe it was. And I just, I don't know. But <laughs> Social media has definitely changed the game a bit in a good way and in a bad way. Um, It's definitely now part of my marketing kit that goes into every year discussions with my partners, you know, Um, and that's ever changing. I mean, all of us, you know, gun lovers and hunters and depending on your political stance tend to get shadow banned quite a bit. And that's just part of the culture that we live in right now, you know, and it's sad. And, um, but yeah, that's definitely changed. I have seen a shift from all of my partners and 90% of my partners are the same from day one as they are right now. That's and cool. I've definitely seen a shift in them and conversations I've had with them about um, wanting to get behind really solid individuals, men and women, not just the women thing, but I've seen a shift of them steering clear of, let's say a gal who has 500,000 followers, if she's right. not legitimately hunting, yeah. using that gear, talking the talk, walking the walk. And it's definitely a shift of, I'd say even five years ago, all they, they, you know, a lot of companies looked at followers and likes. I don't think they look at that as much anymore. They want credibility. Mm. A lot of the companies I work for anyway, that's, so that's, that's been a big shift. Yeah. yeah. In men, both men and women, not just women. That's, that's good to hear because, uh, yeah, I mean, they don't want to damage their brand by, you know, associating with any negativity. And, um, I've seen just recently, I mean, just you make one as a, as a content creator or producer, you make one little slip up. It's bad. People yeah. are all over it. They want to crucify you, you know, yep. it can be bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that's worse for men. I really yeah. do. Like, um, I, yeah, I see it all the time too, of, you know, just people being super negative. And yeah. it's too bad. If you've got the time to sit on social media and be negative on people's, I can't even imagine, even if I, let's say I had a thought and it was someone that I don't really like them or I don't like their brand or I don't like how they promote themselves or stand up. You know, I just don't, let's say I don't like, it. I would never go onto their post and write something negative. Like that yeah. just always floors me that people have the time to, you know, maybe they're trying to be funny, maybe they're whatever, but it's just, some people are just so incredibly rude yeah. and in the grand scheme of life, it only hurts them. Yeah, like it just it makes you them. look negative. Yeah. Like a negative and person. I have always believed that we are a product of the energy we put out there. In fact, our good friend, Johnny Mack and I, we talk about that all the time. I think that when you help other people and you put good positive energy out there and, and you, and you really try hard to, uh, look behind everything you do, the intention of everything you do, that energy circles back around at you. And it's funny, I watch these guys and they stand out and they're super negative all the time and consistently. And it's like, you wonder why you're unhappy and you're, you know, going through your third divorce or what, you know, whatever you're, you know, complaining, you lost your job and you're always kind of, you wonder why it's because you're creating that environment. That totally. energy you put out there, even on social media, whatever, if you're acting like that on social media, you're probably acting like that around your neighbors, coworkers, whatever. Yeah. That just shifts back around and affects your whole life in yeah. my mind. It's the law of reaping and selling, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the secret, which Johnny and I've talked about before. It's the book or the movie called The Secret. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you watch the movie and the movie's a little hokier than the book. The book is really good, but it's about your intention. What is your intention? And putting out positive energy. And putting yeah. out good intentions and having that come back around, like you just said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's cool too. Like that that kind of like law of attraction stuff. Like 
That's straight out of the book of Proverbs. If you've ever read Proverbs, I don't know yep. if you have. I have. Yes, it is. It is. And I <laughs> yeah, totally it's... believe that's how life works. Yeah, I really do. And it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen to good people because they certainly do. But then it's how you handle that in moving forward and trying really hard to find even in something negative to find the positive. And there's been so many times in my life going through a hard time where I'm like, what am I going to do now? What does this look like now? What, you know, uh, you know, what, and it, it, you know, slowing down, analyzing it all and moving forward. And you look back at those tough times, you're like, wow, those were really gifts. Yeah. You know, those are truly gifts, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of a, I was reading this morning, um, there, the proverb that says like, um, after the tempest, the, the wicked will be no more, but the righteous will be established forever. It's like when those hard times come through, you know, the, the bad, you know, the negative people or whatever, like it, it tends to take them out. Right. But you know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're walking the right path, those storms just, you just dig in deeper. And if you have the right foundation and you're just, when the time things go, you know, it clears out, you're established forever. And stronger. Yeah. 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 Stronger. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, um, you know, I know that you, you had, like you said, nine seasons on Sportsman, mm -hmm. um, and then you moved kind of onto digital. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that transition and um, how that's been and, you know, what did you learn from your time in TV kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, my nine years on Sportsman's were great. I have to say, like the the people who worked on the inside, like Monty and Jake, they're great people. Like I really, it was a wonderful experience for me. Um, I have I've heard, you know, maybe a little bit different stories from other people who had a run on there, but I I had a great run and I had a great time. So I switched for twofold. One is um, I started Skullbound with my ex, and we broke up like. Oh, I think almost four years ago now. And I wasn't even sure like what my life looked like because he was my cameraman, my editor. We were literally mm. a two man band. Wow. So all of a sudden the band broke up and I didn't know. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know what my life looked like personally, professionally, like how do I even want to continue doing this? If I'm having to hire out other cameramen and find another full-time editor and everything. And that's one of those times I look back, like such a gift. <laughs> like beyond gift. And, um, but at that time, um, pre breakup, the year pre breakup, I was dabbling in digital because a lot of my partners were saying, Hey, you know, as much as like sportsman's was great timing for me in the decade, so almost decade that I did it. I believe there's been such a huge shift in the business model of hunting and fishing programming where partners want to be able to, Hey, can I go watch that episode you did? You know, that elk episode in Wyoming last year, da, da. when you're on, you know, a platform that's on TV, no, you either catch it the week it aired or on reruns three months later, but then it's gone. And even on their digital platform, it's still a pay to play every mm -hmm. month and a subscription based. Whereas I wanted to go either to YouTube or to carbon TV or some place like that, that was free for everybody. And they could go back. Once someone finds you, they want to go back and watch all your old episodes. And so I, YouTube scared me because I have a lot of friends. I never had a YouTube channel with my full episodes on it, but I had a channel. No, that I was looking I, for one. Yeah. <laughs> showed highlights and such. Well, I would, that's a big, since I'm such a big predator hunter, I would always get the warning label. Oh, dang. And I've even had episode a, a clip that's taken down off mm. YouTube. It's just, to me, it was, I didn't want to gamble everything on a platform that's not two-way friendly, that's not hunter friendly. Mm -hmm. Carbon TV is owned by hunters. And it they're never, they have vowed to never be a subscription-based kind of platform. Yeah. And so in my ninth year, while I was airing on Sportsman's, I put together Skullbound Chronicles, which were highlights of those nine, 10 years, because you know you filmed for a year before it. Highlights yeah. of that decade and just put out uh, Skullbound Chronicles to see how they did. Well, the numbers were awesome. So, and then in that year, you know, the band broke up. So I just shifted my show because it's easier to produce. Um, it's, uh, I didn't like on my sportsman's contract my for those nine years i was contracted for 13 episodes but on my carbon tv contract i can do as little and few as yeah. i want 
Yeah. Um, it all depends on what my media kit is for my partners. If I guarantee you 12 episodes a year, I have to do 12 episodes. Sure. But those episodes can even be like I did one um, during COVID that was make camping great again because that <laughs> camping was about the only thing people could do, yeah. you know. And I did a cook, I did a how to um, can wild meat episode because people were asking for it because I would do some social media stuff on canning bear meat and deer meat and such. So like I can get away with doing way more creativity. I can do a five minute episode. I can do a 30 minute episode um, and just the freedom of being able to have that creative control. It being less expensive because there's no airtime costs, closed mm -hmm. captioning costs. It's cheaper for my editor because he can put them together so much faster. It was just such a better business model that four years ago or three years ago, I shifted to Carbon yeah. TV full time. I went exclusive with them. And that is the only place that you will find my content now. Yeah. Well, don't, um, I would say that one other, I mean, wouldn't you agree that a big reason for your content being successful on carbon is because you had built uh you know almost a decade of experience and um fans like yeah. on sportsman right yes for sure that was a huge part of it um yeah because i've put stuff on carbon too and um and and youtube and it's just it's so you know it's so competitive i mean now especially now like there's so many just amazing content creators putting stuff out i mean i've been grinding on youtube for a long time and it's it's hard to make traction Bro. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that that's a huge part of it. And the part that I, you know, I'm kind of the poster child, if you will, for jump and ship off network to digital and um, being, uh, and like I say, I love the guys at Sportsman. It was a great run for me. I don't have one negative thing to say about it. Um, for me, I did it mostly because business wise, it just made more sense. Yeah, for sure. I get um, that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having that nine year fan base off Sportsman's and my, my outdoor TV at the time um, definitely helped with Carbon TV for sure. Yeah. yeah. And Carbon um, is pretty much run by women. No. Yeah. Yeah. They are. Julie McQueen is the president. Her assistant is Autumn, head of marketing. Yeah. Um, Jamie and the, yeah, it is, which is I I think it's amazing. I you know, I've I of course, I'm going to support one of my best friends. But yeah, it's been it's been really fun. And I think she she didn't specifically intend to, okay, we're going to have an all women team. It just <laughs> felt that way. And they heard the people on the inside are just love it. They love their job. Mm -hmm. It's an awesome, big, huge building in Michigan and, you know, great place to work. Awesome environment. It's how much fun to work inside the hunting and fishing industry. And, and I yeah. know loves to get to know all the producers and yeah, so it's been, it's been really good. And now that industry is changing so much. Carbon is not just digital on their app or online. They're now on Roku, mm -hmm. Fire Stick. So people can just, if I mean, most people I know have a $30 Roku stick. You know, it's a one-time purchase that you can have your Amazon, Netflix, and now you can put Carbon TV right up there. And they have branched into the fast channel world. So Carbon TV is its own channel on like nine different like local now. And I think you call, pronounce it Xiaomi, X-I-O-M-I. Um, all these other little, all these, not little, all these other big distribution platforms mm -hmm. have their own channels and carbon TV is its own channel that circulates shows. So you're getting viewership from there too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's really exciting. And it just, it, everything helps as you know, you know, all, all, all the views start adding up and, and, um, yep. they actually are, are, excuse me, they're revamping their whole website to be a little bit more like a Netflix or Amazon, a little bit cool. more user friendly. I think it should be released um, at the end of this month. And they actually have their own fast channels now, like the Western channel, for example, you mm. can just put on the Western channel. You don't get to choose the episode you watch. It's like regular TV, you watch what's on it, mm. but I'm going to have my own Skullbound channel on mm. carbon TV and they'll fully load it and rotate 13 years worth of content. And that's just one more place to pick up views. So yeah. like the whole business model of TV is changing. Yeah, for sure. So curious. And if I'm getting too detailed here, you can just tell me like back off. But um, <laughs> did, your exclusivity with Sportsman, was that like indefinite or like that, what was the time period of your exclusivity on their, on your contract? Of carbon? No, on, carbon. at Sportsman. Oh, Sportsman. Um, I, that the Sportsman's channel contract is always just year to year. Okay. Yeah. So the, I know a lot of people who have their content on Sportsman's and then have on on YouTube with full episodes and everything as well. Every contract can be negotiated a little bit yeah. different, but yeah. 
but mine was on Sportsman's. I had, I was on Sportsman's and my, I was on my outdoor TV for, I think five years, um, which is their digital platform. But I, uh, yeah, when I signed my contracts every year with Sportsman's, it was just, you know, we get your contact for year. that year. Yeah. Yep, for those nine years. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, <clears throat> well, that's, that's interesting. I'm just always interested in this stuff. So I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess we can, we can shift focus a little bit here. Um, I am interested. Well, first of all, what, what kind of stuff you got, uh, lined up for the rest of the year? Um, this is probably the, the least crazy busy year I've had. In but a you long just time. got back from a ton of stuff. What you said it off air. Tell me again yeah. what you were just doing. Yeah. Um, I just got back from Florida. I did a really fun, um, bow fishing gator hunt with AMS bow fishing, um, two weeks before that I was in Alaska with my boyfriend, John and Heath, my business partner, Heath is my go-to cameraman, um, uh, and my full-time editor. And he just okay. lived down there in the Bitterroot with me. So he's totally awesome. Um, we just got back from Alaska and did a do-it-yourself bear hunt on the Prince of Wales. So oh, that cool. was, that was really <clears throat> awesome. That went great. Is um, that from a boat? That, that style of hunt? Um, no, it is in the springtime. So I'd never hunted Prince of Wales. So I've never, I, I didn't know what to expect either, but the springtime and the fall hunt are completely different in the springtime. Um, and this is, this is such a cool place. If you want to do it yourself, it's called Eagle Lodge on the, in the, on the Prince of Wales, they only offer DIY. So basically they have the lodge and the food and your cozy cabin you get to go back to, but you're on your own for the hunt. Um, and That's then cool. in the spring, There's not a whole lot of places like that. No, it's really unique and fun. And that's how I would always rather do it. And Same. you, and then you, with that, with the week staying there, you get a boat to take out in the mm. spring. And in the spring, the bears are down on the shoreline picking up, you know, well, you can drive your own boat. Yes. Yeah. Nice. You have, yeah. <laughs> and in the springtime, it's that, what you just said from a boat, coastal hunting, the bears are out on shore eating clams and crabs and dead fish and everything like that. Um, in the fall, when all the salmon are running, mm. you don't find them on the, I never saw one bear leaving like from the cabins that are on the shore, uh, or driving around. People don't know that Prince of Wales Island is still got a nice road system. Um, you get with, you get a vehicle that you get to use and you go and you hunt the river systems and, or mm. the streams with all the salmon running. And so it's really fun because I love, I'm a huge angler and I love to fish as well. And Heath does too. And so does and John's, he did, he did, calls himself the world's worst fisherman, but he's totally not. So we had so much fun catching salmon and we were bear hunting at the same time. And so we'd nice. go to these, you know, streams or rivers and fish all day. And I was pistol hunting, hoping to get a bear with my pistol. So I'm talking within 40 yards. Um, and we saw plenty of bears that close. Um, but again, it's hard for me to like put down the rod and just sit there with the gut. Cause they pop out of the jungle for two seconds, grab yeah. a fish and go back in. You don't have a whole lot of time to really so think is, about it. Is it like spot and stalk? Are you kind of like ambush hunting on the river or what's the style? Yeah. Of- well, they're, they're, they're gorging on all these salmon <laughs> that are coming up and half of them are like zombie fish, you know, dead. And the other, you know, some are super fresh. We ate a bunch of them that yeah. week. They were still really good eating. Um, the pinks were anyway. Um, the silvers hadn't really begun their runs yet, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, we, uh, I, I passed on a bear that would have been an easy 25 yard shot the first day because, you know, you're kind of window shopping and I'm like, I don't want right. my hunt over yet. And this, that, well then, um, you know, these one time we, I did have another opportunity, but there were fly fishermen between me and the bear. Mm. And so that was not going to work. And so anyway, I ended up taking the 28 Nosler with me as well. And then the mm-hmm. last day we perched up way high where we were looking like 400 yards down the river. Um, and then maybe another 50 yards this way. And I want the bear that I shot. I saw six different times before I had a shot at him because he would walk down the log really fast, jump in the water, get a fish, walk back out. <laughs> and, you know, by the, and I'm not on the gun the whole time, you know, you're just walking right. like, and to get it on camera. You ready? He, yeah, I'm ready. Oh, he'd already, he'd gone back into the jungle. And when I say jungle, it was the most jungle crazy terrain I've ever been. <laughs> and uh, the footage is amazing though. He did such a good job, but I ended up getting a great bear on the last morning of that hunt. Um, nice. what I've got, real, real quick I side note, my, um, my great uncle left me a Colt Python hunter. The one that came out in like 78 or 79 with the eight inch barrel and the like loophole two power scope on it. Oh, and awesome. Like, yeah. It's so cool. I mean, it's, it's worth a lot cause it's kind of a rare gun, but I did Have shoot, 
I've shot one deer with it. Okay, nice. It That's was, so great. Yeah, I kind of just like scratched it off. Okay, I did it, and then I don't. I kind of leave it in the case because this is a nice gun, yeah, like yeah. antique. But um, yeah. but that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I started pistol hunting. I met um, Jody Carr. Uh, she's with Magnum Research, and they make the Desert Eagle. And mm. they came out here not too long ago with a four twenty nine. Now, mind you, my pistol has four barrels. It's interchangeable, but I've just left the four twenty nine barrel on, and that's all I hunt with pistol wise. But I've taken, uh, I've notched five tags with it. Mountain lion, cool. bear, javelina, um, hog, uh, a bunch of bears. Um, oh, and a turkey. I took a turkey in Texas. <laughs> nice. With like bird shot? Uh, it's with a 429, 240 grain. And, but the funny thing is, you know how people are like, oh, man, I can't believe you pistol hunted that bird. You probably blew it apart. No, it wasn't any bigger hole than a broadhead. You yeah, know, and yeah. Over, yeah. So it was just fine. But again, once again, the negative Nellies can come. And there aren't that many states you can pistol hunt turkeys, but Texas you can. But uh, <laughs> you can do anything in Texas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, I love that Desert Eagle. It's really fun. Um, That's cool. To hunt with. Yeah. So, uh, so you had your bear hunt, your gator hunt. Yep. And now I'm leaving tomorrow to go over east in Montana and just do a DIY antelope hunt, camping out on the prairie. Sweet. Um, I just got I, back from my antelope hunt. I love antelope hunting. Oh, I saw your pictures. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't hunted antelope for Montana yet, but when I was driving back from my bear hunt. I was like just driving through eastern Montana, just like dropping pins because there was like <laughs> antelope everywhere. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I got a couple points uh, built up, so maybe in the next year or so I'll go out there oh, and yeah. try it. Yeah, with a few points, it should be an easy draw. Yeah. Um, and then I've got a, I'm going back down to Texas for a whitetail hunt with some friends from Nosler here in the cool. beginning of November. I'm going back to Wisconsin for a whitetail hunt for just two days with my buddy, Jeff Long, um, and then see my family. My, all my family still lives in Wisconsin, so I'll be there over Thanksgiving. Um, and then I still have a Montana bear tag, elk tag, and deer tag in my pocket. I just don't know if I'm going to get out much. I, uh, I'm a Montana wildlife commissioner, and so oh, that. Cool a full-time job in and of itself. And so I actually just added on that Wisconsin and Texas hunt and was going to leave my fall super open because of the commission work. But um, yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to get out for those Montana tags, but fall's pretty, pretty busy, but. And you're still busy. filming everything, right? Yep. Still filming everything. I just got off a Utah muzzleloader hunt for six mm. and a half days in Utah. And uh, we didn't notch a tag. I didn't see any really big bucks, um, but had just an amazing time in the mountains and, Cool. You know, I might even put that episode together. We filmed really cool things. We filmed moose and <clears throat> really good, beautiful bulls. And, you know, it's, I just think it's important to remind people you don't notch your tag every time. Yeah, you know? for sure. And so I might put that one together for next year. I'm not sure yet, but, um, yeah, awesome. it's been, yeah, it's been already a great fall and I'm looking forward to the next four weeks. Yeah. So. Well, I actually was fortunate enough to draw a deer tag in Montana this year. Hey. So I'll be oh. heading out your way in November. Oh, that's awesome. Good for yeah. you. Do yeah, you have I your spot picked out? Uh, yeah, generally. I got um, the first area I'm looking at. Um, had a fire pretty recently, but I don't know if it's too recently or not. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go check it out, and then I got some backup plans. Maybe Sometimes off air. Good thing. I mean, fresh growth. Elk yeah. love burns. You yeah. know, deer do sure. too. I've seen a lot of big deer and some burns, so that could be a great spot. Maybe off air, I'll run run my spot by you and see what you think. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Let me um, know. Yeah. So so yeah, that'd be cool. Um, you mentioned your conservation work, and I know you do tons of stuff with Mule Deer Foundation. Tell me a little bit about what you just said about the commissioner thing, and then I wanted to ask you about the Mule Deer Foundation a little bit. Yeah. Um, last year, um, a couple of different friends of mine actually within the conservation world reached out and said, Hey, the governor is looking to add two commissioners to their wildlife commission. And the wildlife yeah. commission makes all the rules and regulations in terms of hunting, wow. fishing. Um, they deal with parks and rec. It's, it's a pretty Dang. intense position. And there so were you're like next level involved now. Well, yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> we'll cool. Hey, that's congratulations. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's been a real eye opener. Um, so there were five commissioners, but the governor want the new governor wanted a commissioner for every region, and there's seven regions. So in my region, region two didn't have its own commissioner, and so um, I got appointed last year. My term is a short term. They don't like, for example, with the seven commissioners, you don't want 
it's a four year term, but you don't want all of them leaving at the same time and then right. having a personal commission. And I mean, yeah. I just talked to another woman who was on the Colorado. Uh, she was a wildlife commissioner for Colorado and she served, I believe seven or eight years. And she said, I feel like I've just started starting now to get the hang of it. Yeah. Totally so is it like, is it a group and you guys all as a, as a group make decisions together? Like you get kind of have experts come in and present stuff to you. Then as a group, you kind of vote on it or how's it work? Yeah, it's all voting procedure. Um, and we are, bre- I'm briefed by my region. Uh, um, every commissioner can do it a little bit different, but we all are emailed. Do- it's a ton of reading, emailed documents, um, emailed proposals, emailed concerns. Mm. Wh- and it can be anything from closing the rivers because of the drought to mule deer populations in this area to the, uh, like right now, uh, there's a, a right now an elk council that's separate than the commission who's trying to work up a brand new elk management plan. It's really involved on so many levels. And um, what I was going to say is my term is actually up this January. And if the governor wanted to reinstate me for another four years, he could. Um, I'm, though, most likely moving to Utah. So, oh, really? yeah. So I, I doubt I'd be able to accept that reappointment. But that's neither here nor there. We'll figure that out. But yeah, it's been a real honor. And so each, like I meet with my regional office before every meeting, which is we have four in-person meeting. No, I'm sorry, six in-person meetings in Helena every, every throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what's on the docket for that time, but uh, there's public input. So there's always public input on every issue that people can go online and say, I I disagree with that, or I love that idea. And so we all um, sort of have hours and hours and hours on end of reading public comment, hearing from the biologists, hearing from the specialists, like you said, and trying to make good sound wildlife decisions. It's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's an eye opener. I did not even realize how the whole system worked. Um, It's been, it's been really interesting and really complicated and, um, but fascinating at the same time. Yeah, No, that's, Mm -hmm. that's really cool. Um, How are the uh, mule deer in region seven doing? (laughs) <laughs> um, that's up for debate. You can go online and read. And if you ask a hundred people, you'll get 99 different answers. Um, they, I, I don't hunt. So I don't hunt mule deer in region seven that often. So I, I feel like I know my region so much better, but from what I gather from people in region seven is, um, there are issues that are to play with the mule deer. There can be still great mule deer hunting depends on how hard you want to work for it. Yeah. You know, there's still your classic road hunters who say, I never seen a deer. Well, you never get off the road. Um, <laughs> you know, and the, but there's, there's, uh, I believe right now, I feel like we're dealing with some overcrowding issues, mm. which, um, that's what I've heard. And a lot of the feedback as well, again, getting off road and getting back in is going to serve you better on your hunt. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who feel uh, I've read other people's opinions that feel climate change is a big which is really interesting to me. I've not, not yet heard that argument that Mm. climate change is definitely affecting mule deer. That's a very popular sentiment. Not, I shouldn't say very popular, very interesting take on things. Um, what, you know, what I would recommend if I were you and I was hunting a new region like Montana, I would contact the regional biologist and get their take on it. And now mind you, there will be a lot of hunters who say the biologists don't know anything. I disagree. I think our biologists are some of the best in the business. I think at least I know in my region, the biologists work so hard. They're in the back. They're in the back country a ton. Yeah. I, I run into them all the time um, when I'm hunting. I here. did actually talk to the biologist of the unit I'm looking at. Oh yeah, um, but I think my question, maybe my question, was too specific. I like asked her like specifically about like, is this area regrown enough yet? Uh-huh. <laughs> maybe I should have asked her more generally, like, hey, how are things doing? Maybe but <laughs> um, but she was cool and uh, helped me out oh. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, it's like anything. Uh, I feel if you go onto social media, like this is one thing this commissioner job has been really eye opening to me. I'll go on to some of these pages and I read the comments and I'm like, they're so wrong, like on issues. Right. Or they're they're They have an opinion and it's super negative and they go and they bash they bash the governor and they bash the commission and they bash the biologist. They don't know anything, and da, da, da. but they never have any solutions themselves right. or really, you know, do they? But I still think if you're willing to work hard, there's still good deer. Um, I would recommend, you know, getting off the road as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, and every unit is so different. And like I say, I don't know region seven as much as I know region two region. We are a trophy management unit here in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, people love their mule deer. There was talk in the beginning, right when I became a commissioner of taking away the trophy units, the public spoke and they did not want that at all. And so the biologists and the department worked together to, okay, we're going to scratch that proposal, you know, cause if you at everybody wants something different, do you want to see a lot of deer? A lot of young parents who are taking their kids that they want to see a lot of deer. They, they don't care if their kid shoots a fork at horn, you know, like yeah. they, they want a different experience than someone who has been putting in for 10, 20 years, want to want to want the opportunity to see, you know, a 200 inch deer. And that's what the, uh, that's the kind of hunt they want. Yeah. So it's really hard to say, is that a good unit? Well, it depends on what kind of experience yeah, you're looking for. For sure. You know, I, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, in the arena of, I would just like a nice deer. I don't, I'm not looking for yeah. a trophy. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I, I mean, I and my plan is to, you're around. You yeah. Know? I mean, yeah. my plan is to go in and then get off, like go back off the road for like three or four days yeah, and then come back basically because of Camp water. In. Yeah. 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 Take, yeah. You got to so carry a bunch of water in. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, depending on if there's take, take some filter systems, take a life straw. Yeah. Take, you know, but I've heard that like, there's no water where I'm going. Oh, it, it is. It is really dry. <laughs> oh, Utah's dry. I, which I just spent like seven weeks in um, Montana, super dry. Um, yeah, that is a concern at least where if you needed it, you've got it in your car that you can hike back. Oh, to. for sure. Yeah. 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 We'll have our car back at the road and then just go in for a couple of days and then not like super far, but just enough to hopefully get away from most people. Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. there's not just to be honest, there's not that many places where you can get that far because they'll just hit another road eventually. Yeah. 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 It depends <laughs> if you're, you know, it depends where you are. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but anyway, fun. yeah, it's going to be fun. Hunt. I'm looking forward to it. Um, oh yeah. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the mule deer foundation. So a lot of people I've heard of the mule deer foundation. I feel like a lot of people have heard of it, but maybe don't exactly know really what they do. Um, what, what do they do? Yeah. Well, they <laughs> specifically target mule deer and blacktail, um, that is kind of like some organizations like sportsmen's for fish and wildlife. They're not specific to a one species, you know, mm -hmm. mule deer foundation is specific to mule deer and blacktail. Um, they work on a ton of habitat projects every year. Um, Columbia before, blacktail only or both mule deer, Sitka and Columbia. Um, you know, they, they may do work with Sick and Columbia that I'm just not aware of or don't hear of much. I don't want to say no to that because yeah. they may definitely do that. Um, I'm more familiar of that with their mule deer specific. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but uh, I've been a member, a lifetime member for years for them, even before I started working with them specifically to get their messaging across. Mm -hmm. I work at the Hunt Expo every year, which is their biggest conservation banquet of the year. Yeah. Um, which is but, super uh, cool. If you yeah. guys are listening, you should go to that. It is so much fun. It's, I love the <laughs> next. It's in Salt Lake City in February every year. They have an amazing auction a year. Yeah, I think it's um, two to f February two to five this year. I think. Yeah, it's a little earlier this year than normal. Yeah. But um, yeah, and get tickets to Saturday night. You can come heckle me. I'm emceeing the whole evening. <laughs> so it'll be fun. Um, but yeah, they do a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of habitat work, and then they like and like putting in guzzlers, taking down fence, um, doing a lot of chaining, which is getting rid of um, like scrub brush that's damaging to the grasses and the habitat. Um, they do a lot of funding for studies, chronic wasting disease studies. Um, uh, they used to do a lot of relocation projects of inner city deer, you know, mm. where you've got these monster bucks and the tons of does <laughs> and they have nowhere to go and lo relocating them. But They've stopped doing that with the chronic wasting disease issue um, mm. right now, but they used to do a lot of relocation projects, which are uh, critical in some areas. Um, my gosh, you could drive into Missoula and see 200 inch deer at the McDonald's. I mean, it's, it's not, <laughs> you're not, you're not allowed to even bow hunt. Now there is some bow hunting in other States inside city limits, right. but 
there isn't in like Missoula and in other bigger cities here in Montana and such, but no, I really love the guys inside the mule deer foundation. They're really good people. They do a lot of really good work. They do a lot. They have a lot of like their, um, their muley program for kids. They do a lot of recruitment programs for mm. kids, camps, stuff like that. Um, but they're just one of the many groups I work with. I'm a lifetime member of national Wild Turkey Federation, Safari club international, uh, annual member of SFW, NRA. Um, I think right now there's seven of them that I kind of actively wow. am members of. But that's cool. They all they and they all like like turkeys. NWTF is a great organization. And now that turkeys are restored in almost every state, they do a lot of habitat work. They do a lot of work with kids, and vet, their veteran program is amazing. And you yeah. know, it, a lot of these groups are out there fighting the fight to just keep our heritage alive. For you sure. know, and because it's it's definitely uh, we're at a crossroads right now where families just aren't kids aren't being, there's too many other things for kids to do, whether it's sports, uh, other extracurricular activities, families aren't hunting as much culturally as they used to even 50 years ago. Um, like everybody's grandpa used to hunt, you know, and, and then most people's dads used to hunt. And even though um, women are the rising most uh, quickest rising demographic purchasing hunting licenses, hmm. That's a beautiful thing because studies show if the wife of the or woman of the household hunts, the kids are going to hunt. If the dad hunts, it's like 55% or, and that may have changed that I'm dating. That's interesting. But um, yeah, we need to really fight for our heritage. And as much as I think social media could be a really good thing, especially, and, and I do believe that some good came out of the COVID pandemic where people all of a sudden never before in their lifetimes have they ever walked into a grocery grocery store and had nothing in the meat department yeah. or nothing on certain shelves because of shipping issues or work issues. You know, it may really made people think about where their food comes from. It did, and yeah. I think that the more people understand the lifestyle of hunting, gathering your own meat, getting out in mother nature, the healing aspect of all that, the better we are to protect that for the future generations, because it's under attack by a lot of different groups. Absolutely. And a lot of these conservation groups are, working on way raging war against that yeah yeah now my freezer stayed full of whitetail through the whole COVID thing so that was good <laughs> yeah you open up my freezer right now you're gonna look at elk deer antelope mountain lion bear trout pheasant you name wow, it like, nice is, i eat everything except coyote and wolf um but i eat everything <laughs> um and you know even down to where if I tend to get a little bit older packages that are a little freeze dried, we make it for my roommate's dog. Um, my, my neighbors, if they're not six that we share, like yeah. that's another thing that's really cool about our hunting lifestyle is, is sharing of the meat. Like I make, mm -hmm. I do a ton with bears cause I hunt bear more than anything from smoking it on the grill to making sausage to all that. But it's really fun to make Theringer sausages out of bear or mountain lion and give them as gifts. People really yeah. like that. That is cool. It is really fun. And it's, uh, I think, culturally. That's like a hard sausage, like a salami or something that's like lasts for a long time or whatever. Fully cooked. Eat it with cheese and crackers, just like you would a deer sausage. That's but I've also idea. done a kind that's not fully cooked, like breakfast sausages. Like yeah. um, Lola Meat Locker here in town does really good breakfast sausages and that you cook up with eggs. and. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, I like uh, that idea I, about giving the as gifts. That's cool. Like here's some bear yeah. meat sausage. For Christmas. Well, there's a lot of. I used to host a party at Shot Show every year in my hotel room, and I would always serve up something weird, like yeah. bear sausage, mountain lion theringer, whatever. And it's really fun for people who've never had it before. Yeah. Especially fun after they've eaten half of it, and you walk up to them and you tell them what it is. Like that's classic. <laughs> because a lot of people, it's a weird thing in their brain to get around of eating bear, eating bobcat, mountain right. lion. It's, it's just this thing in their head, but it's delicious. It yeah. really is. Meat is meat. Um, <laughs> completely selfish question but i figured you would probably know this so i just got back from my antelope hunt in wyoming i learned which i didn't know it's illegal to cross state lines with any nervous system tissue yeah um so i had to get the euro done by somebody in wyoming um is or go that to the case the brains out. <laughs> yeah that's true i didn't have time for that unfortunately but yeah. um is that the case so when i get my montana mule deer is that the case as well? I have to figure that out or can I take I believe it across so. the I don't want to give you a definite, but I believe so. Um, and there's also regulations that have changed because of chronic wasting disease of right. where you have to either leave the carcass in the field where you killed it or has to be disposed of 
in a trash receptacle or at uh, way stations that they've hmm. got set up. In other words, you can't just drive down the, the dirt right. logging road and dump your carcass anymore, you know? Right. Um, and that's changing because of chronic wasting disease as well. So I don't want to give you a finalized on okay. crossing. The line, I'll check I, it out. Yeah. That's a really good tip for your listeners because a lot of people would not have even thought of that. It is. Um, yeah. Keep Cause a, keep a hanger in your truck or car so that you can do the old brain scrape and then just go to the car wash and blow the brains out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, that's a good note to say is like, you know, on these out of state hunts, especially guys like me coming from, you know, East coast or whatnot, make sure you schedule a day or two on the back end for logistics to take care of this stuff. Cause it does, it takes some time. Like, yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to be like scrambling around freaking out. Uh, like when we were at Kodiak, this deer right here I actually yeah. flew home with that thing in my backpack. Really? <laughs> yeah. And the TSA didn't care at all because uh, awesome. it's Alaska and like, they're like, yeah. whatever. But oh, yeah, no. now with the CWD and stuff, you got to be really careful about regulations and, and make sure you're doing anything above board. So. Yeah. 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 That's, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, speaking of, I'm looking at my moose right now on my wall. I was able to actually, so we skull capped that. At, I, that was the back country of Alaska. They let me take, that on the plane with me i can't believe it still no and way it, yeah i think it was 2015 well so alaskan been- airlines is great about that like they're it's, and like yeah. the tsa and the like fairbanks airport or wherever like they've probably seen all that so they're just like <laughs> like this didn't like that deer's in my backpack didn't even phase them they're like oh cool <laughs> as long as you like wrap it up with paper towels and tape the the yucky parts quote unquote yeah. like <laughs> yeah and yet here care. it's really weird i was in um it was like Texas or Louisiana where I had frozen gar meat. So allig- I both fish alligator gar. It's one of the uh-huh. most things you could ever do. And it's really good eating. And I wanted to bring some back to Montana. And I was going through TSA and they would not allow it. To, even though they could x-ray it and see that it's just solid chunks of white fish. Yeah. They wouldn't let me. And I was talking to this gal and I said, please don't throw it out. Like if you're allowed to take it home, you can take it home and cook it up and here's how you do it. Like I was so yeah. bummed that I had to waste it, but hopefully she was able to take it home and cook it up. She sounded all excited about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, I mean, I have nothing wrong with hunting internationally and all that stuff. It's just like, it's such a bummer to me to think about like going to somewhere and not being able to take home any meat. And I know it gets used by other people and you can eat it while you're there. That's fine. I'm not, not knocking it. It's just like, I would be bummed out that I couldn't like bring home all this meat for my family, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That but, is one of the big bummers of Af- Like I'm going to Africa again next year with John. Cool. And, uh, yeah, it is a bummer. But if you arrange it ahead of time, they will almost, it is always used every hour. Sure, so, absolutely, yeah. They will cook up the next day from what you hunted the day before, yeah. which that's always really fun. For sure. But you're right, being able to, there's so much meat. And I like I shot an Elin um, back in this over 10 years ago, and oh my goodness, those things are monstrous. They're like bigger than any cow yeah. here, any yeah. brand of cow here. But it, they, it all gets used, but it is a bummer not yeah. to bring it. Like I just love seeing, like my kids have eaten like, far more deer meat than like beef like my yeah. little girl like when she was a baby we used to like give her like deer femurs and she'd be like chewing on them. like the other day i was packing lunch for my son and it was rice and sitka blacktail backstrap and i was like how many other kids i wonder in the united states are taking sitka blacktail on their lunch for school today yeah. and yeah. actually i posted it on instagram and one other guy said mine is <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. So funny. Yeah, I just love seeing that. But anyway, um coming on, you know, an hour here. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I've really enjoyed chatting with you. And um why don't you tell folks I'm looking forward to meeting you again, uh, or meeting you in Salt Lake this year too. Um yeah. but uh where can folks find uh Skullbound Chronicles and all your stuff you're doing? Yep, they can watch Skullbound Chronicles full episodes on Carbon T V. It's free and uh they on social media at Skullbound TV because that was the nine years on Sportsman's, but they yeah. can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And it's me. You know, I always say that a lot of my friends who have TV shows kind of have other marketing people that sort of do their social media for them. But nope, it's just me. It might take me a little bit to get back to you, but if you have any questions or whatever on gear or anything, yeah. it's me behind the screen. And cool. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I, yeah. Thanks for um, I. That's how I I reached out to you on Instagram, and um, I've been so blown away by just the hunting community in general. Like you know, since I started, like even when I was just starting out, like some you know big name people, I would just message them, and they'd be like, "Yeah, sure, I'll do it." So like, it's been cool. 
Well, who doesn't love to talk hunting? Yeah. <laughs> You know, exactly. I always think of these as just like sort of a chit chat, you know, and oh, yeah. I, I literally could talk hunting all day long. It's, yeah. uh, and I've I, made so many great connections with people like, because, you know, out here in Virginia, I don't, there's not a ton of people that do this kind of stuff. So just being yeah. able to connect with people and, and then go out to the expo and meet everybody in person. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's really cool. Well, it's a total honor. And, uh, whenever, if you see anything on Instagram or Facebook and you want to chat again, give me a holler because yeah. For sure. I, uh, I've never say no to a podcast. They're just super fun to do and great way to meet other people who just love what we love. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate your time and good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thank All you. Right.